I'm glad you guys are here. How are we doing? Great to see you all. And uh, it is October 1st. So we're going to start a, a four-week series today. And uh, it's going to be in preparation for a three-week series that's coming in November that is going to be fantastic and you don't want to miss. And yes, we are having Party in the Parking Lot next Sunday. So Party in the Parking Lot is just, it's an amazing time. You need to invite your friends. Again, we, t- we say this every year, uh, but anyone who has kids, little kids, your friends uh, that may not necessarily come to the church, uh, uh, this is a time to invite them to, to our property and say like, hey man, mi casa su casa, and we want you to enjoy this place. And this is a place where uh, people are loved and we believe in fun. You know, one of our uh, core values as a church um, is fun. Now, obviously, like Jesus and people are before that. Um, but we believe in fun and we believe in having a good time. And so please come to Party in the Parking Lot. And yeah, we're going to kind of like, uh, we're going to jump on the uh, coattails of, of the pickleball uh craziness in the world and of course you don't you don't have to play you, you know we're not going to force you to play but if you want to play we, we we're setting up three uh courts out there and we're going to have a little tournament and it can be a spectacle if you don't want to play and the, of course there'll be everything else going on so you don't even have to be near it if it annoys you because i know some people are annoyed by it as well um it is annoying uh how much people talk about it i'm into it i'm sure i annoy people the sound of it is annoying i don't know if you've been uh, in touch with the news, there are people who have like literally tried to shut down pickleball parks because of how annoying the hitting of the ball is when it's in proximity to their house. And so uh, if that's you this morning, you can stay over on that side of the parking lot during the pickleball tournament. Uh, also, just want to remind you that uh, weekly, Jared, Jacobus, and I, we do a podcast that is called The Rest, and it's a uh, kind of a continuation of the Sunday morning content and a discussion around that. And so, um, it, you know, really what we're trying to do is just give you tools and opportunities to engage with the material as you're growing and developing your faith and your understanding of who God is and what it means for your life. And so, uh, you know, one track that you might have or, or go through here at the church is that you might engage in the Sunday morning messages uh, and if you miss them and you're not live or in the room, then of course you can you know, watch, the, watch the, the video back online or on the app, or you can go to YouTube, or you can listen to the message podcast, and then you can listen to the rest podcast, which is usually about 30 minutes as a supplement to the Sunday morning, and that could be kind of a rhythm through your week. They usually come out, uh, uh, the message podcast, the one that's related to Sunday's message, comes out on Thursday morning, so on your Thursday or on your Friday, you can kind of listen to that. It's short, it's fun, uh, and uh, we talk about some of this stuff in greater detail. And then I do wanna encourage you to engage in the message. When, uh, when I'm up here teaching on something and you have a question or you honestly, like I'm, I'm calling you, like you don't like something that I say or you disagree with it or you wanna hear more about it, please uh, email us, email us, and, uh, and, and ask us, and we'll talk about it on the rest, all right? So I believe the email address is the rest at 514church.com. If not, then send it to joel at 514church.com, and we'll find it and say that it's a question for the rest. But please, like, uh, we've had a couple of those, and uh, we really want to keep you engaged in what's going on and have that discussion with you. Um, I have, uh, throughout my life, been involved in, you know, different things, right? Different things that kind of um, I enjoy or, or that, I, you know, seasons of life or, or whatever that may be. And, and throughout my life, um, as all of you, I get, I get kind of like pinned as that guy for a particular thing, right? You know, where you're known for, oh, I know that guy, he's like this, or, or the thing that comes to mind when people think about me. And throughout my life, I've had some things that come to people's minds when they think about me. And it's not always been awesome. If, I know that's hard to imagine, but it's not always been like a good thing. And honestly, even, even as a pastor, and, 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 and uh, if you're good at being a pastor, uh, a lot of times that's not a good thing for people to associate you with. So there's some level of relativity in the idea of what you're kind of pinned for, what you're known for. 
But uh, there have been some, some times when I've been known for some lesser things. Now, listen, everybody, listen. I'm gonna be vulnerable, okay? I'm gonna share with you something that I'm not proud of and that is not necessarily good, and uh, you're not allowed to use it against me, okay? You're not allowed because I don't have to share it. I'm sharing it with you to be helpful. So if, if you think that I'm trying to help you give, give you something to kind of jab me in the ribs with, you're wrong, all right? Uh, but this is true, and actually, it is embarrassing. It's like one of those things that, like, I'm, uh, when I think about the story, I'm just like, no, why? Uh. Um, but uh, back in, like, 2000, uh, I think it was about 2004, you know, I'm 24 years old, and uh, I was interviewing for a couple different pastoral jobs, uh, and so uh, youth pastor jobs. And, you know, I sat with about three or four different churches in the area and was kind of talking to them and going through the process. And, uh, of course, some of those places knew me a little bit. You know, they knew me from so-and-so or how or whatever. They knew me, and some didn't. And um, I ended up taking a job. Uh, at the time, it was uh, New Albany Christian Church. But uh, there was another church locally that also offered me a job. Not all the places I interviewed offered me a job, so just making sure that's not what you think I'm trying to communicate. But I did get another job offer, and it just wasn't going to be a fit. And I had a nice, cordial interaction with those people, and it was lovely and all that stuff, and there was no major problem there. It just wasn't the right, you know, the right, that one wasn't the right fit. Uh, about six months later, the people that did the interview called me back, and they said, hey, you know, we, uh, we do this thing uh, every year, um, and it was started several years ago, and it's, a, it's kind of a ministry during Halloween time where we bring people in and we try to like show them what hell is like. It's called Hell Stop. Um, kind of a very dramatic, and I don't, I don't agree with the theology of Hell Stop and all that stuff. Uh, but what they would do is they'd kind of bring people in and, you know, it was like a haunted house and there'd be like fire and screaming and devils and all types of intense things to try to show kids that, you know, you don't want to go to hell, which is... I think that's a good message. We definitely don't want to go to hell. We don't want hell to be here and all that. But a very intense uh, approach to ministry. And they called me and they said, you know, we were thinking that uh, uh, you would be really good if you would come and work at Hellstop and play the devil. Because we thought that you were very intense and your intensity and your, you know, we thought maybe you could act. And I think I told them that I had done some acting and, uh, and they said that your intensity. And I just thought, I mean, that is literally the worst possible thing I could ever be associated with. The intensity of the devil. And I'm just like, no, like I, 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 I left the wrong impression. I, you know, it was, it was nice to know they offered me the job. Just remember, they offered me the job. So there was something about intensity. You know, my intensity, I think some of you who know me, you might say that I'm intense. And I think I am intense. I'm pretty sure I'm intense. And I think I've gotten less intense. And I've tried to become something different, something more balanced. I certainly, uh, I don't know what you're known for, but like, I don't want, if you will, like if I could pick, I wouldn't say like, you know what? I wanna be known for being intense. You know, that's not necessarily what I would say I want to be known for. And so that's my question for you this morning is what are you known for? It's a great exercise in self-awareness. You know, who are you? What do people think of you? And what do people think about when they think of you? How do you come across? You know, we have all different types of different uh, personality aspects and we have different uh, you know, moments in our life and times in our day, and we have certain attitudes and dispositions towards all kinds of things. And, uh, but somehow we can kind of give off a general singular impression to people, depending on how well they know us or how close they get to us. And so what are you kind of like, what's the impression that you leave? What's the impact that you have on somebody's life? And that, that's a rich question, right? Like what kind of impact do you leave in people's lives when your world overlaps with their world. What does it sound like? What does it look like? What impression do you leave? You know, are you known for your personality? You know, are you just, are you like Mr. Personality? Um, what about skill? Like is the main thing that people know you for, you know, is just like some ability that you may have, something that you're good at doing? 
not necessarily a bad thing. Your talent, you know, you ever you know, met somebody and you just, that is so talented, you, they're known for their talent, their, maybe their artistic ability, their ability to draw something, their ability to perform something. Um, uh, maybe you're known for your mess, you know, your mess of a life. Maybe you're known for, unfortunately, the, the kind of the, the ruin that you've left or the trouble that you're in or the problems that you've caused or the number of speeding tickets you've gotten. I don't know. Maybe, you know, you might be known for that. And, and it's kind of an interesting thing. When in, in the Christian worldview, you know, we believe that people are made in the image of God. And whenever you stand eyeball to eyeball with someone, you're not just looking at a mere mortal, right? Like you're looking at like, this is the, the imprint. This is the impression. This is, this is God's creation made real right in front of me. The, Im, you know, image bearers of God. There's not just a person there that has like one thing that, you know, marks their whole life. And of course, no person can ever be kind of identified uh, with the worst thing they've ever done. No person is that way. Even the worst things that people have done, we can never minimize or reduce them to the worst thing that they've done and say that, in, you know, that, in, that captures their entire personality or their whole personhood. But we do that, right? And when someone has a mess on their hands, we can certainly just think of them as, oh, that's the person who, you know, he's gotten pulled over 35 times or whatever it is. The sin in our lives, maybe, uh, you know, a lot of us, it's kind of weird, like you might be known for uh, your money. You know, like your, like how much money you have. I just want you to think about that for a second. Like some people, they strive for that their entire lives, right? Like I wanna make a lot of money, but maybe they don't, uh, phrase the question or the idea in their mind that way. You really want to be known for money? Like just having money? Like that's your thing. That's like what you want to be known for. You want everyone to think, oh, that person has a lot of money. That's the top. For some people, I think it might be. What do you want to be known for? I want you to ask yourself that question right now, and I'm asking that question to you. What do you want to be known for? Make it as simple of an exercise as just one word. You know, like I said, intensity. Somebody, somebody said that to me. Interviewing for a church job. You're no, you know, we, mm, that was the, the label. That was the thing. So, so take a moment while we're at church together to think, what do I want to be known for? What's the word? What's the impression that I want to leave? And of course, not just some type of facade or some type of just scraping or just kind of thin, you know, veneer of, of it, but something that might actually um, materialize in someone's mind after they've had somewhat of a considerable amount of time with you. You know, they've spent some time with you. Maybe they've looked you in the eye. Maybe they've at least had, call it like half an hour coffee meeting with you at the minimum. And then, of course, you move past that, and then it's your family, right, the people you live with. And then it's like your extended family, the people you have Thanksgiving and Christmas with and hopefully more. I don't know. But what do all those people, because I think what you would want to have is, is if, if, you, if you have a level of consistency and a level of character and a level of whoever you are coming into itself, that there would be a thread that is consistent that runs through all those different kind of pockets of people that you may interact in in your life. And what do you want that to be? What do you want it to be? Jesus told his disciples before he was crucified, he, he gathered them and he brought them together and he had a great conversation with them that's called the Upper Room Discourse. And and he had some conversations on the way to this upper room, which is where he, you know, has the Last Supper, and they, he washes feet, and then Judas, you know, says he's going to leave and go, and Jesus, he sends off, and he goes and sells Jesus to, you know, to the bad guys or to the, to the soldiers for 30 pieces of silver to the priests, and, uh, and he has all these conversations with them, and all these conversations, none of them are vacuous. You know, Jesus has spent three years with these men, and he's, he's taught them all kinds of things. And so you can imagine, right, like if you sat through even just a series of mine or just any teacher or you're reading a book, if you get to chapter seven, right, you know, it usually builds on something that you read in chapter one or chapter two or chapter three. And if you're in chapter seven and you don't understand something, you gotta go back. And so nothing that Jesus is saying here 
is just vacuous. It's not necessarily new. It's something that he's been trying to impress upon them in different ways and through different ways throughout all of his teaching and all of his time with his disciples. But the moment of John, uh, of John 13, which we're gonna look at in a second, is, is, is actually where the impact is. It's, it's, the, it's the relationship to where he is in his life. He's taught all these things, and now he's coming to the end of this life where he's gonna be crucified and, and then he's going to gloriously resurrect, but he's making sure that before this kind of drama unfolds, that he makes some very crystallized points and he's saying them right to them uh, as, as a sense of almost the uh, manifesto. This is the main thing. I've taught you this a hundred times. I'm summarizing it here. Here it is. And Jesus said to his disciples in John 13, verse 35, and I'm gonna put it up on the board. I just want you to read this with me. It says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So I just want you, to, I want you to go back for a second right now, and uh, what Jesus says is that if you're his disciple, then what that means is you're going to be a being of love, and it's not just going to be something that is part of who you are. It's going to be the impression that you make in all those different pockets of people. And I want you to ask yourself when I asked you, and just be honest, right, with yourself. I mean, if you can't be honest with yourself, like, then there's a lot of questions you have to ask, but like, just be real with yourself. Like, no one else can hear what's going on there. God is there and he already knows, so don't trick yourself. What did you actually say you want to be known for? And did what you want to be known for match what Jesus says you will be known for if you are a disciple of his, if you are a follower of his? Did it match it? Was it close? And if it wasn't close, then today is the beginning of orientation, right? It has to be adjusted. So much of what we do in this room and in this building and in our private lives as we try to grow in a relationship with Jesus is have something rattle us and bring us into the place that God actually um, wants for our lives, has for our lives. And if, if what we say if messages and series and ideas and what we're teaching, if it just kind of smacks up against some giant iron uh, vault that you have locked and really the impression that, that Jesus is trying to make in our lives doesn't get through to where after you leave here, there's a reality change that's taking place in your life, then that's why we're in here. Like we have to, it has to be real. It has to become part of what you're doing. What are you doing when you're here? Are you opening up your heart and saying like, I want what God has for me fully in this time, in this moment right now, I want it. Or are you listening to what I'm saying, deciding if you like it or not, deciding if it was good or not, and then leaving and going on about your business? That's not what this is. This is a place to let the words of the living God who made the heaven and earth transform form your innermost moments and then your outer realities. What did you say? Are we on target? Are we known for this? And here's the, the sober truth. What we do with Jesus is we often make Jesus into our own image instead of letting him make us into his. We often make Jesus into what we want him to be. I mean, we spend sometimes more time with taking what our idea of Jesus is, figuring out what we think about him, kind of shifting him and, and kind of putting him in, a, he thinks like this politically, or he might think this about them, or he might do this action that way, or here, you know, and we try to mold Jesus into what we want him to be so that it fits what we want us to be instead of going, Jesus, what do you want me to be? The, the, the one who's supposed to, sh to shape is the master. He's supposed to shape us. And if you've lived in this kind of reverse 
you know, this kind of telescopic thing where you're looking in the wrong end and you're trying to make Jesus what you want him to be so you can justify or whatever it is, like it's time to stop that. It's time to stop that. And so ultimately, we all have to throw up our hands and go like, I'm not there. I don't, I'm not. I, 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 that's not what I thought of. And, and, and man, if you want to have some fun, ask somebody if they think you're known for anything in proximity to this and see if they'll be honest with you. What Jesus is doing when he says this in John 13, again, is he's stacking uh, this idea of what the, his vision is for all humanity and what the reality of new covenant. This is, this is um, when Jesus says this, he says, a new command I give to you. A new command, a new, a new covenant, if you will. Love one another. And this is how people will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. It's a new command. It's a new vision. And it's, it's something that he has kind of been trying to show people from the very beginning of his teaching in John 7, verses 37 and 38, Jesus has come to this festival, uh, the Festival of Booths, which kind of commemorates the movement of the tabernacle throughout, uh, throughout the story and the history of, of Israel. And, and one of the times uh, he's there, you know, on the last day of it, he stands up and he says some wild things that have to do with this covenant that he's just teaching them. He says, uh, he says, let anyone who is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from in them. And when Jesus says this, if anyone who's thirsty, because there's this ceremony that they do where the priest pours out the water and there's water in, in the ta tabernacle where they use it for cleaning and, and all of those types of things. And so Jesus, he stands up and says, I am the water. And if anybody wants to, is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, you know, will have livers of li rivers of living water. And, and one of the first things he says here is when he says, let anyone, is what he's doing is he's saying anyone, anyone can join in to the gift of God and the discipleship of Jesus. Anyone. The message of God is for anyone. It wasn't just for the, the you know, the, the Jews that were having that festival. It wasn't just for the Greeks who were kind of integrated into the society. It was for anyone. And what Jesus does here is he kind of brings this Davidic promise to the whole world. Even though the Davidic promise was through David and a specific thing that Jesus would, he says, I will fulfill my promises to all of you. And I will give you living water if you want it. If you want living water, you can get it. It doesn't matter where you grew up. It doesn't matter if you're part of this. It doesn't matter if you even know this language. If someone translates it for you, you can receive the living water. And when Jesus says uh, this to them, he says that you'll get something, this water, and what it will do is it will flow from within you. The water that you get will flow from within you. Now, when Jesus says this, he's echoing something from Isaiah, arguably one of the greatest prophets of the people of Israel. And what he's getting at is this crazy notion that the promise of God's gift to humanity has now been democratized. Everyone can have it. And that now it's been thrown open to the whole world. And exactly as in Genesis chapter one, the image bearing vocation, not just for the royal elite, but for the whole human race is being offered. You can be an image bearer of the living God and fully experience everything that God has for you. Now, this is a massive thing because people don't know that this is God in the flesh, but he's saying, I am your source to get the living water and the living water will flow to you and through you. And how will this covenant take place? How will you get this water? How will it happen? And what Jesus gets into and what is understood throughout all of the book of John is that he's gonna have to do something in their hearts. That the living water is going to flow through them and out of their hearts. And so this new promise of living water is a promise of, it's the means of new creation. Now I know, I know, just hang with me. Hang with me here. Jesus says, I'm the water, you follow me, 
and you will receive the living water and it will flow within you. And that is being offered to everybody. And this is the beginning of God's plan that humans would be kind of conduits of living water. And he tells them that basically in order for this to happen, you have to have your hearts reoriented. The living water was a picture of the spirit of God. The spirit of the living God could not dwell in the temple when it was sinful, so it leaves the temple. The people of Israel are waiting for the spirit of God when Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up and he says, if you follow me, then you will be a conduit for the spirit of the living God. And in order for you to have the spirit of the living God, your temple has to be cleansed because the one that was here physically was dirty because of your sins, but that is just a representation of your hearts. Your hearts need to be fully cleansed. Therefore, you will receive the gift of the Spirit of God when I die and through my death, I cleanse the temple of your hearts, obliterate sin, give you the opportunity to get back on board with God's original plan, and then what I have done for you in cleansing your heart you will do for the world. You are to be, you and me, to the world, what Jesus was for the nation of Israel. I want you to think for a second. You need God's residency to realize your role of love. Jesus lived around the Sea of Galilee and just uh, south of that is the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea represented no life. No, no, when, you, when Jesus is talking about water, he's talking about water in the context of a desert, basically, where, where, where you know, you and I have a hard time thinking about the necessity of water because we don't need it. What I mean is we have it, and we have what we need. You know, even today when people are serving in the military in the desert, you know how many pints of water they need to drink? They need to drink 16 ounces or one pint, pint an hour in order to just be in the desert. Water was everything. So when Jesus says, I'm the water, and now I'm going to give myself to you, and it's gonna cleanse you and quench you so that you can go cleanse and quench. You are gonna have it flow through you, livers, livers, livers of living livers, rivers, rivers of living water, not just, listen, you and I are not just recipients of God's spirit, but instruments and agents of new covenant life. We're not just recipients, we're instruments. So this is the precursor, this is chapter one and two to where Jesus gets where we've already read. You guys, I gave you a new commandment. I'm gonna give you my spirit. It's like water. It's gonna quench you. It's gonna cleanse you. And it's gonna flow through you. And that's what, when that flows through you, when you have the spirit of the living God flowing through you, the way that people will experience that transmission is love. Because what's about to flow through me is the most monumental display of self-giving love that could ever be displayed. And that spirit is now given to you. And these people understood, wow, a new covenant is like a new exodus. It's like Jesus died, he rose from the dead, and he freed us from slavery, the slavery of sin and death, so that we could go give love to the world and be free to do so from the powers and the darknesses that are real. That's the basic theology behind the new covenant. This is my command to you, that you love one another. You can't do it. You cannot love each other without the spirit of the living God. 
and the spirit of the living God comes into you and cleanses you and, and forgives you of all your sins. You're cleansed and then it flows through you to bring cleansing and love into the world. And when that water moves into this world, when it, when it fills up and, and with streams and irrigates all of the different places with the practical nature of the way you spend your time, your money, your, you, you know, your, your, use your hands, all of it, people will go, that's a disciple of Jesus because this is a desert and that's living water. Our job is to become living water in the midst of the desert land that we all live. What are you feeding? What are you nurturing? Love is more important than anything else. It is what ties everything completely together. That's Colossians 3.14. It's more important than anything else. The way that we love, it demonstrates who we are. Our goal in life is to love like he did. I'll ask it this way. How good are you at being a Christian? <laughs> how good are you? Now, some of us have this idea that being good or doing good or that any type of even behavioral change is not what it means to be a Christian. And that's a massive re re reorientation that I've tried for so much to get us to understand that that you're not saved by good works, but you're saved for good works. You're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, Jesus to do good things. The grace of God is the ability that God gives us through himself that you cannot earn so that we can receive what is needed so that we can go do. And so when you start to do, how do you know that your doing is right? What's your barometer? How do you measure it? How good are you at being what God called you to do? Do you have the target right? You know, are you pious? Are, are you kind of like, do you feel like when you're good at being a Christian, it means you're pious? It means that you kind of like do all of the ritualistic things perfectly? What about you're correct? A lot of people in the world think that, that the hallmark the cardinal reality of being a Christian is to be right. Information, to know something, to be able to trump, to win the argument. Can I just tell you, like, I believe in sound defense. I believe in reason to the point of it's intermingling with the supernatural reality of what the scriptures show us. And so Christianity stands on good reason, if you will. But if you think that reason is what makes Christianity what it is, you're wrong. Christianity is found and tested and made real in love. That's how it is. That's how it's real. So you can be wrong and be a Christian because you love so well. Many people have. You think about the Enlightenment. You think about uh, the Reformation. These things happened over the past 500, 400 years. Many people and the church became what it became without it. Why? Because of self-giving love. Because of what Jesus did in them. Because the rivers of living water were flowing out of them. And it was just the touch. It was just the, it was the immersion of the love of God around the desert planet that made us able to stand here today and say, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to do that which he's committed unto him until that day. That's the reason that I can say faith comes by, by, you know, by hearing the word of God. It's the reason that I can stand here and say that like, I love God. It's not because people were right, but because people were disciples rightly. When I ask the question, how good are you at being a Christian? This question is synonymous with the question, how well are you at loving people in your life? 
How do I know if I'm being a good Christian? Is it prayer? Is it fasting? Is it reading my Bible? Is it memorizing my Bible? Is it going to church? Is it taking communion? Is, is it practicing the Sabbath? Is it practicing solitude? You see, many of those things are how you become transformed. They're important. But the purpose of the transformation is the fruit of transform transformative love. That's the purpose. That's why we do. We're trying to become like Christ. You see, Jesus, when he came to this earth, he spent time in solitude and in fasting and in prayer. He spends 40 days. He's tempted by the devil. And the reason that he came to earth is not so that he could do all those practices. The reason that he went into the desert is so that he could kind of show who he was and, and we could see who he was. And he could kind of, as that human part of him, he could kind of get ready for Gethsemane. You know, that's, that's, that's what he's doing, he's kind of expanding his tolerance for the pain of what the human will go through when he dies on a cross and he's betrayed by his friends. But the purpose of his life was not to go through those practices. The purpose of his life was that those practices and that who he knows he is and who he would, who he would solidify who he is in the desert would become real and self-giving love. The purpose of Jesus' life was servanthood. It was dying on the cross. It was love. The practices support that. If you want to get into this, John Mark Comer just wrote a book called Practicing the Way. And the, the, the general idea of this is be with Jesus, become like him, and do as he did. Sometimes liturgy and prayer and fasting look so much like good Christianity that we slip into it and do it so well while it's secretly evolving into a being who does these types of things and gains a sense of personal pride and accomplishment. And sickly enough, listen, these things done with improper alignment can create distance from the people around us and give us a sense of self-righteousness, which ultimately has the opposite effect of their intentions. Everything that we do as we're transformed into the likeness of Christ, in the presence of Christ, in liturgy, in worship in here, in your prayer time, in communion, is so that as we sit shoulder to shoulder with Jesus Christ himself, we become like him and then we bring what is him into the world and it's found in love. Reverend Benjamin Creamer said this, if our Christianity doesn't result in greater compassion for our fellow human beings, then we have deeply misunderstood Jesus. We've deeply misunderstood Jesus. I want you to just kind of, I want to stop right here and I just want to, I want to pray for a second. And I want us to just take some time to erase whatever our ideas were of what the pinnacle, of what the point is, of what it means and what we're known for. I want to pray. I want to ask God, to, you know, to reveal to you, what are you known for? I want to ask God to, to help us show the way, the, the, the reality of this and help us to bring something new this week into the relationships that we have in this room with the people we're sitting with. And could it be that just, just this basic foundation of the rivers of living water, of receiving them and being conduits of them, if that could just begin in your mind, even artfully, to start to change the way you interact with the people in your lives. And as we go through this over the next four weeks, we're gonna look at lots of the steps of what it looks like to become transformed into beings of love and to be known for love. So let's take a minute, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, God, that, that you have this purpose, this singular purpose, and, and, and you, you ingrain in your teaching the same picture of Genesis 1, the same picture of Ezekiel and Isaiah and all of these things about living water and growth and the kingdom of God, and it all comes through and arrives in the person of Jesus, and, and all of it has to do with the presence of God and the purpose of humanity. Father, our purpose on earth is to be beings of self-giving love. This is what we're supposed to be known for, God. 
Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we ask for forgiveness for anything that we're known for that's not what you said we're supposed to be known for. Forgive us, God. I mean, church, known for the whatever it is, whatever you could be known for, God, for cool church, which is ridiculous, for, uh, you know, smart church, for, uh, uh, you know, just the people who only do good things, church, whatever it is, God, like, we want to be known as beings of love. We want the fabric and the reality of our time with people to be supernatural, that our way and our life and our words, the things we do and the places we go and our interactions are just supernatural, transformed by you. God, help us to see the great privilege of being conduits, of being the abode of the spirit of the living God, the temple, and help us to see the great responsibility and not just receiving the rivers of living water, but letting it flow through us. When we think about God, how so many of us as parents, we teach our kids to do certain things, not just for them, but through them, what they would do. You know, we, we, we want you to know this, so when you grow up, you can do the same thing. God, help us to see our relationship with you in a similar way. Help us in one hand to, to, to catch what it is you're giving us and then with the other hand to give it away. And God, as we, as we talk about theology and talk about the words that you said and, and look at some of the context, ah, we can so easily escape the reality of just the people that we're sitting with. And God, help us not to let ideas and lessons to move us away from the reality of loving the people in our lives today. God, help us to do that differently today. We can't go back, God. We can go forward. We can go forward the way you wanted us to go forward and help each and every one of us to make an impression on someone today that if that, that impression was added up with the next 15 impressions, that they would be known for love. Whether it's your wife or your husband or your, your kids or your friends, your coworkers. Help us to live that stamp of reality daily. And let this question do its work in us, God. Because if it's the top of a container, we open up the top and we look in, is it, is it possible within us to be beings of love? And if no one, if you don't know Christ, if you don't have the spirit of, of, of God in you, then you are in a desert and you have no water. And I pray that if anybody is in here and, and they go, you know, that love idea is just, it's so high, it's so big, I don't know. But they would grab onto you first and foremost you are love and we're made in love and then from that relationship become like you and live like you i pray that people would follow jesus for the first time today say jesus i want to follow you i want to be a disciple of you help us to be known for what that looks like we love you so much in jesus name amen love you guys we'll see you next week all right Hey everyone, we are so glad that you hung out with us today. Uh, we would love to connect with you. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to hear from you. So please text hi to the number on the screen and we can't wait to see you soon.